Good to have you with us tonight. Glad to have you joining us on Facebook Live. Take your hymnals, turn to hymn number 55. And uh, those of you watching online, you may not need a hymnal. You probably recognize the intro. We're going to see when the roll is called up yonder, all three verses. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. The morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. When the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore, and the roll is called of yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called of yonder, when the roll is called of yonder, when the roll is called of yonder. yonder I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies and the roll is called but yonder I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Let us labor for the master from the dawn to setting sun. Let us talk of all his wonders, love and care. When the and our work on earth is done, and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the roll is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. Amen. That's good. Don't turn anywhere. Look across the side of the other page, hymn number 56. Those of you online, that's uh, when we all get to heaven. And again, we're going to sing all four verses on this one. So sing out. I want to hear you. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be.
opportunity uh, to go and celebrate the birthday of a dear friend and they were able to go uh, and the trip went well and I think that uh, their visit was a success and so we praise the Lord for that and uh, we praise the Lord that they are home. All right, other praises. All right, praise, praise the Lord for a good week at work. I can echo that. Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord for a good week. Praise the Lord for a good week. Uh, I thank the Lord that uh, uh, it has been a good week. You know, we uh, had great services last Wednesday, and then I think the Lord blessed us with free good services on Sunday, uh, and it, it truly was a blessing. It's always good. Uh, to be in the house of the Lord. All right. Any other praises? I'm not going to force anyone to speak. All right. Unspoken prayer request. Everybody here. All right. Uh, spoken prayer request. Praise the 
pray for Sharon Troji with her back. All right. So that's going to get better. Pray for Sister Sharon Troji. A wrenched her back. Uh, and if you don't know what that's like, be thankful. All right. Also, please be praying for Sister Darlene uh, and family uh, for health. Um, also, we have, uh, we know folks that are pregnant and folks that have had babies. And I was talking to a preacher friend today up in Georgia and, and uh, asked how his daughter was doing. Uh, she, he said she's miserable because her baby is due any time. So we need to be praying uh, for her and all the others that are uh, maybe in, in the same boat. All right, we also need to continue to pray for Sister Doris. Uh, we have a lot of folks that aren't feeling well. Uh, and it's, praise God, it's, it's nothing necessarily serious. Uh, just uh, a lot of colds and uh, I think some of it's exhaustion. Uh, some folks are working a lot of hours. So we just need to uh, pray for one another. And like I always, uh, I say, when you look around here and you see folks, or you don't see folks, uh, pray for those you don't see, but pray for each other that you do see. Amen. Because uh, even though we're we're here at church, uh, doesn't mean you're necessarily feeling the best, and uh, doesn't mean uh, that your life is carefree. Amen. Uh, we're able to persevere uh, because of God's grace. All right. Any others? All right, if not, uh, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, and then I will uh, receive the offering. Okay, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your watch care over us, and I thank you that we're able to be here tonight, and we're able to gather together in your house and, and have this time of worship, singing praises unto you. We're going to be able to open your word and uh, read from it and just uh, feast on the bread of life. And I thank you for these praises that we heard. And we truly are thankful for the safety and travel uh, that you gave our family and, and all the others that were traveling. Uh, we are very thankful. And then we do pray for the physical needs that were mentioned here tonight. Sister Garlene and family with health issues. Sister Doris and and there are others who are uh, having uh, physical difficulties. And we just ask that you would touch their bodies and that you would heal them according to your will. And we pray most of all for the spiritual needs represented. For those of us that have friends or loved ones that may not know you, I ask that you would use us to bring them to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be conscious of your presence. And we do ask that you would bless the tithe and the offering that it would be used for the furtherance of the gospel. And we ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen.
to the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 16. I want to talk to you about a term that I'm sure everybody here and everybody watching, well, probably most everybody watching uh, online is familiar with. Uh, the term is scapegoat. And uh, we've heard that, or at least when I hear that term, I associate it with somebody uh, that is being blamed for something that went wrong that maybe they weren't necessarily responsible for. Right? Maybe you've heard it. Somebody says, ah, oh, they're making me a scapegoat. Right? Because somebody's got to be held accountable. Right? Somebody's got to be responsible. So that person is the scapegoat. And, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of things uh, that we get from God's Word that uh, uh, people aren't necessarily familiar with. And, you know, this last week I talked about when the children of Israel... Uh, they were complaining while they were in the wilderness, right? Nothing, what's new, right? And uh, they told God they wanted meat, and he gave them quail. And I, I mentioned that they ate so much quail, they got sick to the point that it came out their nostrils. And that's where the saying, pain through the nose, comes from. Well, a lot of people didn't realize that, that had biblical origins, and a lot of folks don't realize that the scapegoat has biblical origins. So we're going to start reading 
here in Leviticus chapter 16 with verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. He shall put on the holy linen coat and he shall have the linen uh, breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle and with the linen uh, miter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and so put them on. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat uh, on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall, uh, shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. All right, we're going to pause there. So just to remind you, uh, Aaron's two sons uh, sinned against the Lord and went in uh, to the temple uh, in a state, uh, they, they weren't right with God. They had unconfessed sin and they died. And so what we are reading here, verses 1 through 6, um God is telling Moses, listen, you make sure Aaron doesn't come in whenever he wants. Because uh, if he does, he's going to die. So make sure Aaron under understands this is how he is to come in. And he lays it out in verse 3. Uh, Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for for a burnt offering. And then verse 4, it talks about his attire. And, you know, today we might not think a lot about the attire, right? We might think that uh, it's a big to-do over nothing. But God set these rules. And God said, for you to come before me, and remember, when he goes into the holy holies, he is going into the presence of God. So he says that this is what he has to have on. He has to be wearing these, but before he puts them on, he has to physically wash his flesh. And so what we see first in verses 1 through 6, before Aaron is able to do the job, that God wants him to do, he must be right with him. He must be right with God. And so, uh, going through verse 4, it shows what he has to do physically uh, to be in a right position, to be able to go uh, before God in the Holy of Holies. And he tells him, uh, again, look at verse 5. And he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats 
for a sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. Look at verse 6. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. Just a side note. Uh, this applies to preachers, but I think it applies to uh, every Christian. God had a job for Aaron to do. What was that job? That job was to go before him and to offer an offering on behalf of the children of Israel. Are you ever in a situation like that? I know you're not making a sacrifice, but are you? do you or have you ever been asked to go before the throne of God on behalf of somebody else? We call it intercessory prayer, right? I'm sure if you've been saved any length of time, you've had somebody come to you and say, will you pray for my loved one? Or I've got this need, will you pray? Listen, the last year and a half, two years uh, with this COVID stuff, I'm sure you've been asked to pray for somebody that has COVID, right? That's not unlike the job that Aaron had to do. Now, Aaron was going before the Lord on behalf of the entire nation Israel. And he had an important role. And so in order for him to be able to do that job and do what God is instructing him to do that we've read about and will revisit, first, he had to be right with God. That's why he said, and Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement for himself and for his house. See, sometimes we think preachers have to do things uh, that we don't have to do. And, or, and maybe not do things, but should be something that we don't have to be, right? The preacher has to be right with God all the time. And you know what? I'm the first one to say that. Amen. He has to be right with God. If he is going to be God's man, leading God's people, he has to be right with God all the time. Now, I'm not saying he's to be sinless. But when he sins and he's convicted, he needs to make it right immediately. Right? Uh, you ever have a bad attitude? I know nobody here has, has ever had a bad attitude since you've been saved. Can that be considered sin? Yeah, I think so especially if you take it out on somebody else, right? Maybe you're having a bad day or you're irritated for whatever reason and you end up snapping at somebody or being a little curt with somebody, right? Uh, when you do that and you're convicted, you need to confess it immediately and get right with God. You say, oh, that's, that's no big deal. Sin is sin. And if I have unconfessed sin, God's not going to use me. Aaron was not fit for service until he uh, completed what was in verse 6. He had to do that. Uh, he had to make sure that he offered these offerings for himself and his house. Before you go into your prayer closet and pray on behalf of somebody else, you must be right with God. Right? And and I say when I believe that uh, when you confess your sin, you're not to say, Lord, if I've sinned, because that's disingenuous. You know you've sinned. Now, there may be 
Uh, you remember what Job was doing while his kids were partying? He was offering sacrifice and interceding on their behalf in case they unknowingly sinned against God. And so there may be times that we do sin and we're not aware of it. I think those times the Holy Spirit is going to make us aware of. Right? So before Aaron could perform his duties as a priest, he had to get right with God. Now that's true for me as a preacher and a pastor. I have to be right with God if I'm going to do the job God wants me to do. But that's right for you also. Right? You've got to do it. You've got to be right with God. Because you know what? Uh, we're all part of God's army. Amen? And uh, it's not just the generals or the leaders that serve. It's all of us. And so you want to make sure that you're right with God. So... That's the first thing that we see. Verse 1 addresses the fact that he wasn't right with God. Verse 2, God gives Moses a warning. Hey, don't let Aaron come in the Holy of Holies anytime he wants. He's going to die. He's got to do this first. Right? Maybe, maybe we would keep our, our life squared away more if, if people started dying when they went into God's presence in their prayer closet. I'm not saying I want that. I'm just a thought. All right. So now let's look at verse seven. And now we're going to look at the scapegoat. Scapegoat. That's a beautiful thing. It really is. Verse seven. And he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement with him and to let him go for a scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make an atonement for himself and for his house, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil." Where is he going? He's bringing it within the veil. You remember the veil? Um, Nathaniel was teaching in, in Sunday school, and uh, he, he was talking about the veil, the crucifixion of Christ. What happened to the veil? It was rent into from top to bottom, right? So he's getting ready to go into the Holy of Holies. Verse 13. And he shall put the incense upon the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is upon the testimony, that he die not. And he shall take of the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it with his fingers upon the mercy seat eastward, and before the mercy seat shall he sprinkle the blood with his finger seven times. All right, so this is, again, now we are seeing the activities that he has to do, uh, again, to make himself right with God and fit for service. Verse 15, Then shall he kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring his blood within the veil and do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. And he shall make an atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanliness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions 
in all their sins. And so shall he do for the tabernacle of the congregation that remaineth among them in the midst of their uncleanliness. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make an atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. All right, so I want to pause there for a minute. So here we see that he, he had to go and... First, there were two goats, and each one of those goats had a distinctively different role. The one goat was the sacrifice. That goat was going to be the one that was sacrificed and put on the altar. The second goat was the scapegoat, and we're going to see his, his duties here in a minute. So, First thing he had to do, Aaron had to prepare, prepare the mercy seat. And so that's why he was sprinkling the blood seven times uh, to the east and in front of. It said before the mercy seat. That's in front of the mercy seat. And so he prepares it. And now he has sacrificed uh, the sin offering. Verse 18. And he shall go out unto the altar that is before the Lord and make an atonement for it and shall take of the blood of the bullock and of the blood of the goat and put it upon the horns of the altar round about. And he shall sprinkle of the blood upon it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and hollow it from the uncleanliness of the children of Israel. So he is making... Uh, this is the act where he is uh, making the mercy seat uh, holy uh, and he is doing it uh, for his sin, for his household, and for the children of Israel. But now look at verse 20. And when he hath made an end of reconciling the holy place, and the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. So here we go. Listen, this excites me. And you're going to see why uh, I find it exciting in a minute. It's very exciting, I think. Verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. So here he is. Aaron has gone in and he's made intercession for well, he uh, got right with God, made intercession for his household, made intercession for the children of Israel, but here's where that scapegoat comes in. He lays his hand. Can you picture it? He lays his hands, both hands, on the head of this other goat. <clears throat> and he confesses all the sins. And all the sins, all the iniquities, everything that stands between them and God onto the head of this goat. And then he is delivered to a man uh, in the wilderness. Look at verse 22. And the goat shall bear upon him all their iniquities unto a land not inhabited, and he shall let go the goat in the wilderness. Picture that. Aaron lays his hands on this goat. And in essence, what he is doing, he is transferring the sins 
of he and his family and all of Israel onto this scapegoat. And then that goat is taken by a fit man out into the wilderness and he's released, never to be seen again. Jesus Christ is our scapegoat. Amen? <laughs> All right. Uh, look at Isaiah. Hold your place here, but look at Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. And look at verse 21. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. See, when Jesus Christ was on that cross, he was on that cross not for anything he had done. He was on that cross for us. Because he was taking on himself our sins, our transgressions. He hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. You remember while Christ was hanging on that cross that the sky went dark for a period of three hours? You know why that was? God had to turn his back on his son. Because God cannot look upon sin. And Jesus Christ became sin for us. That's what 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says. Now, Israel's sin left. It was gone, right? It, it left them. What about our sin? Look at Psalm 103. Keep your Bibles handy because we're going to take the time that's remaining and look at a few verses. Psalm 103. Give everybody a chance to find it. This is one of the most exciting verses. See, Satan wants to throw your sin in your face constantly. What did God do with our sin? Psalm 103, look at verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. How far is the east from the west? Now, I'm not talking about with planet Earth, right? Because if I go east long enough, I'll come back around to my, where I started. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about a straight line. As far as east is from the west, that's how, uh, how far he hath removed our transgressions. Now look at uh, Isaiah 38. Go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 38.
All right, Isaiah 38, we're going to look at verse 17. Behold, for peace I had great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption. Look at this. For thou hast cast all my sins behind thy back. Can you see what's behind your back? I'm not talking about using mirrors or cameras or anything like that. I mean, something's behind your back and you're standing there and you're looking. You cannot see it. Praise God. He cast all my sins behind his back. Amen. Now turn over to chapter 44, Isaiah 44. All right, Isaiah 44, verse 22. I write that down, Isaiah 44, verse 22. I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions, and as a cloud thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. See, it's Satan that wants to bring up your past. Everybody has a past. You have a past. You have a past. You have a past. You have a past. All of you. And God doesn't judge me on my past because I'm saved. I'm saved. So when I stand before God and he looks in the Lamb's Book of Life and he sees my name written down, He's not going to discuss any of my sin with me. I'm not at the white, great white throne of judgment. I'm at the Bema seat. And the Bema seat is where you are rewarded. Praise God. I'm not going to be at the Bema seat because I'm so good. I'm going to be at the Bema seat because of what Christ did for me. He was my scapegoat. He took my sin. He was, he was innocent. He was totally innocent, but he took my sin on himself. Look at Jeremiah chapter 50. Right? Jeremiah is the book right after Isaiah. Chapter 50. Isaiah... I mean, Jeremiah, uh, chapter 50, I'll get there. And we're going to look at verse 20. Jeremiah 50, verse 20. In those days and that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. For I will pardon them whom I reserve. Praise God. What God has done for Israel and Judah, he does for the believer. Amen? All right. Now let's go over to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. Gospel of John, chapter 1. Look at that. We might get out, get out of here a little early. Everybody, calm down. Don't get too excited. So here we are. John chapter 1. Look at verse 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He was the sacrifice, but he was also the scapegoat. All of the, the ugliness in the world, all of the sin was put upon him. Remember, he was made sin for us. He that knew no sin was made sin for us. 
Now, uh, look at 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. Look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Jesus Christ is our scapegoat. And we've just looked at, I don't know, what, eight, nine verses that deal with the fact that as a Christian, when I die, I am not dying in my sin. If you are saved, you are not dying in your sin. And what I mean by that is having to answer for your sin. See, there, everybody is going to stand before God. Everybody. The people that mock God today are going to stand before him. Those that thumb their nose at God and those that say there is no God, they will stand before him and they will bow before him. But every living being that has ever lived and that ever will live, one day will stand before God. And you're going to be in one of two groups. You're going to be at the, the white throne judgment or you're going to be at the Bema seat. At the great white throne judgment, you are answering for your sins. Why is that? Because you did not accept Jesus Christ and what he did, right? That's what we're talking about. Jesus Christ said, I am taking Stacy Carpenter's sin on me. And if he accepts me as his savior, he won't have to answer for the sin. But if he rejects me, if he, you say, well, I didn't reject God. If you do not accept God, call it what you will, you will stand before the great white throne of judgment. And then you will be held accountable for your sin, your sins, your sin nature. And what does that look like? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. God at the great white throne of judgment, he'll open up the books and you'll be judged out of those. Over at the Bema seat, we're going to be rewarded. Now our works, the Bible tells us, our works will be tried by fire and they'll be revealed. There'll be one out, they'll, they'll be one out of six categories. There'll be wood, hay, stubble, or silver, gold, and precious stones. Wood, hay, and stubble will be destroyed. They're being tried by fire. And there won't be anything left. And we'll be rewarded for what we've done. Amen? That's what Christ did for us. He's the scapegoat. So here's what I want you to do. Everybody under the sound of my voice. For the rest of your life, when you hear that term, I want you to think about Jesus Christ. He was the scapegoat. He took our sins, and we're not going to have to answer for them. That doesn't mean I can go out and live like I want. If, if, I, if I'm saved, if I'm truly saved, and I love the Lord, I'm not going to want to go out and live a life of sin. I'm not. Heard a man say that after he got saved, he could run around on his wife all he wanted to. He could go to the bar and drink all he wanted to. He could do all the sin he wanted to. And he said, but when I got saved, I no longer wanted to. I got a new want to. 
And I believe that. If you're saved, you're not going to look at your salvation as a license to sin, but a license to serve. And that's what God desires of us. I don't know where I got this quote, but it says, Faith transfers our sins. Right? For by grace are you saved through faith. Christ removes our sins. Amen? <laughs> and God remembers them no more. God doesn't forget our sins. He remembers them no more. And that's not just semantics. You forget things. I forget things. But God has deliberately chosen to remember them no more. That's why they're as far away from us as the east is from the west. That's why they're behind his back. Corey Tim Boom said that God put them in the deepest part of the ocean and put up a no fishing sign. Amen? Amen. God's not going to remember them. You'll remember them. Satan will remind you of them. But God won't. So let me ask you. Are you sure you're saved? Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? If not, get that settled tonight. Yeah. All right. We're going to pray, and then we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, again, we do thank you that we've been able to come in and open your word and to study from it. And I thank you for the scapegoat. I thank you for the picture that we see with Aaron and Israel and, and the way you work. I thank you that you've forgiven me, that you truly remember my sin no more. Lord, help me to be mindful of that and help me to use that as motivation to live for you and to serve you. Now, Lord, I ask that you dismiss us with your blessing. Bring us back at the appointed time. And we ask this in your precious and holy name. Amen.